I have one son, he's 15 years old, and I remember he was seven years old and I'm tucking him into bed the very first night that we lived here. He said, Mom, are there any dead people downstairs? And I'm not gonna lie to him, I said, yes, as a matter of fact, there are. And he said, oh, okay, good night. When I made the announcement to my parents that this is what I planned to do, they flat out told me, you can't. You get chatting with people and they'll say, so what do you do? I've lied and said, oh, I'm a stay-at-home mom or I'm a hairdresser. <laughs> you have to be strong of character because you're meeting people at the worst time of their life and they unburden a lot of negative stuff on you. People sometimes compare funerals to weddings and weddings people plan for like a year. Whereas when we're planning for a funeral, we're doing it over maybe two or three days. And it's a really significant event for people and you just want everything to go off smoothly and without a hitch. I opted to become a funeral director based on the high school aptitude tests that everybody sort of standardly takes. And it wasn't something that had ever crossed my mind or that I had ever thought of doing. But once I started looking into what the job was all about, I really felt that it was something that I was meant to do. The embalmer gets to know people's secrets. I mean, you don't hide much from us. I have been made aware of body piercings and tattoos and things on people that their family members never knew they had. The only other thing that gets interesting is sometimes what people ask us to put in the casket with somebody. Um, that's the sort of secret part that nobody else is going to see but there's just tucked down inside the casket little personal items or mementos or photos or... Most interesting one was probably some x-rated photos <laughs> that uh, somebody wanted tucked in there. <laughs> but we've tucked in bottles of beer or bottles of liquor or little leather pouches of herbs, <laughs> things like that. I think that for people who don't have the opportunity to see somebody before they're cremated or buried, um, there's a little seed somewhere in their mind that says, was it really him? I don't know. I didn't see it with my eyes, so there is value in having an open casket for sure. It's really quite a fascinating process. You can see the change as it happens. When someone dies, if their hands are down at their side, the blood's going to pool in their fingertips or wherever. Um, and as the fluid goes through there and the blood gets pushed out, you'll see that purple staining kind of going away and a more natural pinkish color coming in. And that's the sort of first part of the process. And then we have what we call the cavity embalming because your circulatory system doesn't get as deep into your internal organs as we need them to. And that'll take any excess blood out of the heart, it'll drain fluid off their lungs, it will uh, remove the stomach contents, all that sort of thing. That's what goes bad. <laughs> so um, we get rid of all that stuff and uh, everybody's nice and clean and ready for their visitation if they're going to have one. I've been doing this for um, over 20 years, 23 years, and I still get butterflies in my stomach while I wait for the family to go in the room and look at the person to make sure that they like the way they look. It still means that much to me that I want them to be pleased with what I've done. You do see people that come through um, after they've died and yeah I know I knew that person that was my bank teller or that was you know I had to embalm the body of one of my co-workers once and it was really hard and I went in and I had a good cry with her and then I said okay Betty we're getting down to business and I wouldn't have wanted anybody else to do it I try not to treat anybody any differently than anybody else I don't care if you are the Prime Minister or if you collect a welfare check. I'm going to treat you the same. The only time I had um, sort of a personal struggle with that 
was the deceased person that I was looking after was a convicted pedophile. That one made me stop and I had to check my own emotions about, about that and remind myself. Yeah, that one was the one time that I was sort of tested in terms of, do you really treat everybody equally? Yeah. Funeral directors are on call 24 hours a day, seven days a week. They do the ugly work when somebody's killed on the highway in their car. The funeral director is right there working with the firemen with extracting the body from the wreck. There is a burnout rate for sure. Funeral directors, if you look into the statistics, rank right up high with um, police officers and people like that in, in terms of divorce rates, in terms of alcohol and drug abuse. Um, and depression. And I thought if I could retrain and have another profession, I would want to be a midwife. I've spent a long time dealing with death and the end of life for people and um, seeing people out on their farewell and I think uh, being there to see people on the way in would be pretty special. At this point in my career, I sit and listen to every funeral my little chair out in the hallway there and I sit and I listen because I want to hear about the people. I want to learn about people and what made them tick and what made them special and yeah. I don't just get the service started and then go have a coffee or go do paperwork or something. I sit and I listen. <laughs>